Welcome to a new test and teardown video. Yes, we are looking at one of the last Bull and Care units for this time. It's a measuring amplifier type 2607. So finally, it's a more versatile unit. That means you can use it for a lot of different things and not just a very, very special thing. So, oh yeah, okay, it does indeed um, also support the special uh, Brühl and Care microphones. So, uh, you can see this very special connector here. So, there is of course a microphone preamp for the, the microphone series. But, you can also just use the normal input here. It's called direct input. And then there is a variable gain control and this is the input attenuator with an overload indication and then we can select some different things uh, from the the input section and then there is an output section and an output connector again they just love to use those a little bit annoying uh, connectors so this is driving me a little bit nuts to be honest i don't really like those I prefer B and C connectors, but I'm not going to get that, am I? So the output section, there's also uh, an uh, overload indication. And again, attenuator and filters. You don't need to use the, the filters if you don't like to, to but you can. Uh, this is uh, the filters for audio related um, things. Uh, in the manual, it explains the different uh, filters, uh, the different curves. Uh, I don't uh, really understand exactly why you need that uh, many different uh, uh, filters and why they are ordered like this instead of just A, B, C, D. So I think this is a little bit funny. Why that? And then we have, of course, a, a low cut and a high cut. So obviously, if you select these two, then you are in... Uh, full audio range from 22 hertz to 22 kilohertz or you can select an external filter using the rear mounted uh, connectors so let's have a look at the rear side this one can be powered from an external battery and they're reusing <laughs> This connector is also used as a mains connector for almost the same kind of age equipment as well. Uh, I think it's mainly English uh, equipment that use uh, exactly this connector for mains, just so you are warned about that. And then you can, of course, uh, select between AC or DC input. It is also a little bit confusing. So you point this switch down to AC and then this is your AC input. Or if you put it up, now it's your DC input that is down here. So that is a little bit, hmm, kind of not so clever. It is probably smart for routing of the cables inside, but this is not easy to understand from a user point of view, right? And that is, of course, the external uh, filter connectors. Uh, all the uh, built-in filters, they can be selected using a remote a remote connector here. So either you um, select the different filters from the front, that is called manual, or remote, that is this connector. The unit is built into, I think, double cased. It is really, really heavy. Can't wait to look inside. Yeah. But first, let's see if it works. So let's try and play with this unit. I have actually just been playing around with the different uh, features. And I must say, it is <laughs> completely full of loose connections. I mean, it's, oh, yoy, 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 yoy. it's almost impossible to get anything stable out of it. So right now, I just don't dare to touch anything <laughs> because I got an output. So. This is a one volt input RMS. And what we see here is it reads exactly one on the meter. So 
this is 3 volt full scale and I'm not using any attenuation so that means it is actually reading out correctly and the output here you can select between AC or DC if you go to DC you get a DC voltage that is exactly following uh, the meter readout so that is very useful for plotters if you want to use this uh, to amplify something and pre-filter it uh, for audio filters or whatever and then uh, plot it then it's uh, super good to use the DC output obviously and we can add some uh, averaging as well as well as RMS impulses and peak holes and positive and negative peaks and all sorts of good stuff here so this is really really nice as well well look at the loose connections here if I just touch no oh, yeah see that one ooh and signals so I mean see of course I should be able to turn on and off that filter so that one is just absolutely crap when I have this in and I am lucky to get uh, audio or a reading here right I, I actually verified the low pass filters uh, or high pass is actually working so all that is perfectly fine and if I yeah I think it's time to open it yeah what else did I try yeah so see 300 volts RMS is now my full range and see this really really cool indication here I really like that I think I think it's neon but look at that so this is the input attenuator and it goes like that and then okay maybe I should turn off the input okay we need to be nice and then oops no more light no more light and then oops we got light again right so that means the 60 and the 70 they don't work so and if I want to go or continue further down then I can of course play with that one and then I can go all the way here right so so that now we have tested all the lamps So yes, we have proven in any combination, it is the 60 and the 70 um, indication here. We need to see where is the fault. Also, what you should know, since this is a uh, an amplifier you can use for almost anything, right? Not just uh, audio, it could also be vibration, uh, whatever kind of thing, right? So what you do is you click here, and then you can take this out and then you can lift up the scale this is the I don't know if I can do that with my fingers yes I can see you can lift up the oh, damn it that is difficult to do but the idea is you can change this scale to whatever kind of technology it is you're working with so it's actually reading out uh, exactly what you want could have been cool if there would have been another one on the on the back side uh, that could be a good way to save the number of them right uh, a whole bunch of these uh, followed uh, when you when you buy the instrument by the way and then you can put in what you like so yeah I think we need to open it and uh, see if we can fix the switches so now we are inside that was a little bit difficult to get out super easy to unscrew the two screws here on the side but uh, this unit just ooh, what kind of lubrication snesky snesky is here right so this is the the bottom view and the first thing that I see is the power on off switch look at this isn't that just a cool solution <laughs> I like it 
So that is great. Look at that capacitor. It is so big, it's actually touching the outer chassis. So when it's taken in and out, this capacitor takes some kind of damage. This can't be good. Also seen, looks a little bit like somebody's been replacing some diodes. I don't know. Got a little bit of, I don't know if you see this green blue goop under here. Also, if you look for kind of green bluish splat, that is, let me take a new one. I can't remember exactly what brand of contact spray people are using but that is exactly how they kill the switches oh if only people could use the good stuff yeah but they didn't know any better so of course this unit had some sort of problems with the contacts so people sp spray it with some stuff that eventually just makes it even worse look at that Bo both green and blue gloopity gloop and it's just all over the place here so but it's easy to access the switches uh, so plus for that good good but now I need to go and clean up all that see that was a fast little clean here but obviously I need to do that a lot better what else can we see here Main transformer. Oops, what is that little? Is that something I can push? <laughs> Ooh, you gotta love this. Wow, everything is in modules like that. What a beautiful design. I love it. Mains transformer with the Boylan Care logo on it. Also got some contacts down there, and this also looks a little bit like this needs cleaning. And this is obviously the input. Oh, also, look at the rear side of that. And this is, by the way, the input attenuation variable and that one is just completely uh, unstable and there's a little converter we've seen this before and they are very happy to use exactly this is a switch mode converter a boiler care made and here we go 2N3055s aha uh -huh. so here you, the, here you have it a switch mode power supply yay How are you gonna? Oh, that is easy. Oh, yeah, 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 I love it. Super, super nice modules. So, how are you gonna poke around with that trimmer? Oh, you need to have a razor board, right? So, you have it up here, and then you poke around with the trimmer, and then. Yips. And if this would have been an HP, you would have a little razor board in a socket here. You could click, and then. You could do service and all this kind of stuff. You don't need to go and order this. No, it would be inside this module or inside this unit. <laughs> well, that is, of course, not the case with this one. Yeah, I need to go down here, here for the lamps. Let's have a look at that module. I think we should take them all up and have a nice look. Look at the contacts if they are nice and clean. Maybe they are marked or no. Oh, see again. Here we go. Contact with some green stuff. This can't be good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's sadly, it's all of the contacts that is this infected by somebody's 
trying to clean this. That is sad. I can also see it down here. It's not looking too good. Funny to see a two-sided PCB like this, and then why not use both sides of the contacts in parallel to obtain double contact? I mean, why not? It's gonna work better, right? But no need for that. I better start marking the different modules here so I don't uh, <laughs> put them in wrong. Because I think here I should be able to swap some modules and probably swap them. I don't see any um, um, those little pins down here to, to prevent me from screwing this up. I'm not even half way through the cleaning process here. But I found something I really like you to see. So this is the output attenuator, remember? And the shaft goes through the different boards there. They got a, there's a slot here where the contact is rotating down here, right? I don't know if you can see the metal. That is a little springy thing. And it is inside this piece of plastic real good. And then you plug in this card. And then you got contacts local to this board without any wires or any other funky things. So that is actually a pretty cool solution, isn't it? So you've got some different attenuator resistors and transistors for amplification. But look at the holes they drilled here. That is for leakage. So they're going for low leakage between the resistors. Look at that. How nice is that? And again... Some green nasty stuff around the contacts. And it's real bad on the contacts down here, you can see. I don't know if it's easy to see on the video, but I can really see they're bad. So here is the switch mode power supply. I guess this is only needed when you're running on DC, but maybe it's also used when you're running uh, on AC, I don't know. So that will be the main power switch you're driving the transformer down here. And that is uh, probably a little control circuit for that. I see some signal diodes and some stuff. It's very, very comp... Uh, I mean... It's very, very simple. It's not complicated. That is what I wanted to say. Really? This is all you need. But then there is a high voltage uh, power supply, and that is this one. And the regulation is made using three neon regulators. And see a smart thing about the two diodes here. They go in series. And this way it can handle more voltage so this is probably an adjustment for the high voltage supply and this also um, I think this is mainly to drive the bulbs under the meter because I expect those to be neon bulbs so this is the input attenuator and there's a top board like this and they are really nice to write down here what is what and those contacts are nice and clean so that means nobody's been poking around with those so I also expect this board I need to pull it up like this and yes this is what happens when nobody goes and clean it up or try to clean it because people just tend to do more damage with all sorts of contact chemicals instead of doing nothing, to be honest. Just use absolutely clean alcohol and nothing else. No chemical funky stuff. And it's going to last a million times longer. The reason for those holes here 
that is actually to disconnect the different tracks because the gold plating needs direct electrical contact for everything here. I am in the cleaning process now of all the bottom or the main board contacts. Trying to get that, this uh, contacts up, can, uh, contact up here. Can you see how it looks like? Look at that. It's just it's total slime on the back side here. Look at that. How the heck that cannot at all work. Why do people put this gross slime into their contacts? Oh no. Whew, after a lot of cleaning, I'm now going after the indicators under the display. But I don't know if they are to blame or if it's the drive signal that is to blame. So I just go for the indicators first. But then I, I see we got two connectors for all the indication. And we got a red and a white wire that will probably be for the meter. But it's hinged somehow down here. And the only way to access that is to take away the entire front plate. So I'm going for the screws here and then pulling everything out. But of course, I'm also worried about <laughs> the two shafts for this and for that one. I don't know. Can I do this? I thought that was going to be easy, but that is not easy at all. Everything else is in a socket, but there's a black wire going through a hole and it is held in place here and it's soldered to those two points. So this is why I really need to document that. Otherwise, I'm not going to figure out how to reassemble the front again. Uh, I'm so sorry you can't see how long this takes, but I am slowly getting there. So that was the black coax, but then I got black, yellow, and red, like that. And that is important to remember. And then I think I will be free. So that is again neon indication, and again another neon indication. But I think I can leave them in. Oh, yeah, yeah, there is a lot. <sighs> and we're in, <laughs> finally. <sighs> now I can really show you guys how slimy and how gross everything is. This is not good. See all the green goopity goop that comes out of everything here. And also, all this slime there spring all over the context look at the wires here how slimy everything is and the bottom piece of that uh, aluminium here is just feeling really yeah exactly wet and gross and it's not good but now i'll be able to take out the meter and figure out about the missing indicators So it is amazing what a little bit of cleaning can do. So now I'm trying to figure out how to repair all the all the two broken neon bulbs inside the meter. So my first idea was I could probably just take um Oh, this is annoying. I could probably just take one of those neon testers and see, we got those two connectors on each side. And they're just the neon bulbs, right? So how about I do that? And then I'll show you what happens. See, all of them lights up. So that means we got neon in them and probably two of them, they just need a little bit more voltage or current or whatever is needed you know to ignite them fully so they just don't do anything it could also be the driver circuits oh, i'm a little bit 
Is it this or is it that? Hmm. So what I need to do is uh, now figure out uh, the pinouts and try with as little turn on voltage as possible and see if there is truly a difference or not. I think it's all about drive voltage. Now I've been uh, playing around with the two contacts and I think I'm not okay. I'm sorry. I'm not super proud about uh, <laughs> this uh, hand-drawn stuff. I at the beginning I, I thought oh, okay. I was just going to write down the the numbers of the bolts and then just it should be super easy to poke around and figure out the pinouts. But it was not that easy, and so uh, it's obviously because some of them need a little a little bit more dry voltage, and I was just running it you know at the first little. as low as possible right and then i cranked it up and now now i can get all of them to light except the 60 and the 70 and that was exactly the ones that didn't work on the video and i bet that will be the two contacts here so this is what i'm doing oh we should be careful here i got i got nasty voltages on those two and some serious resistors and here is my my pinout idea. This is how you see the two contacts, and when you do like this, that is uh, my two common. So that means if I want to light up 80, then I go for the the common, and then the 80. Doodly doots, and let's see if that works. Yay, it works. So that is what I think I need to do. I need to open that meter completely and see if I can fix the or repair, change them to some other bolts. I mean, I need probably I need some special tiny ones. Let's see how small they really are. That was difficult to figure out how to open and get access inside the meter. But the secret trick is this one. Those little springy things, they go in here and hold here. So it, all you have to do is take a screwdriver in and bend them out and then you can come in. After taking out all those four screws here, look at that. That is definitely a PCB. And this reveals I was right about the two commons. And I was right about the pinouts and all that. Wow. You need to be careful when you take this module out without breaking the meter. The needle there is just made of super super thin mega fragile so be careful but now we can play with this little lamp indicator module wow and they just insisted this had to be inside the meter i mean you could have put the lamps a million other places on the front but this is obviously the the most sexy place to put it so yeah Definitely, we're going to put it the hardest, most impossible way in the world. And here I mark with those two little dots, the two lamps that is not working anymore. And I do see them more black than the others. I think I'm going to go and try and clean up a little bit first and see if it's leak. And then I'm going to try again before I completely disassemble this. This is clearly a little bit interesting to play around with because if I take some of the others I mean it's more it's easier to see if I do it like this right see here is one that is not working as well and this one is working those two don't work but if I reverse the voltage they work 
So that means they also got a little bit low or oh, cathode um, poisoning. So all I have to do is reverse the voltage on those for a little while and then they will shine again. And the two that doesn't work, they're probably completely dead. But can I get new neon lamps this tiny? Yeah, that's going to be difficult. About neon bulbs and cathode poisoning. So just to prove my point, look, there's definitely neon in all of them. Isn't that funny? The more I look at this unit, the more depressed I get. I mean, I just keep finding all sorts of weird things here. Uh, just look at all the solderings. Everything here looks like a hand solder job. What do you think about this? It cannot be everything, right? And now you're going to see something. That one in there, right? That is not supposed to have contact with this metal. As you can see, it's isolated here, right? But there's a little solder blob, and it is just lying on top of that metal. So if I push here, no, it's actually, yeah, there's a loose piece of soldering here. This can't be good. And if you look at some of the modules, This is the kind of professional solder that was professionally made. Oh, I'm not super happy about that distance there, by the way, but... And that is just repair job. The two transistors, they were replaced by someone who did not care to clean it up correctly. And also, the repair dude used a wrong screwdriver like this one oh his was even smaller wrong screwdriver and then over tightening and just breaking it up like that and if you look at this little pieces of metal i can actually move these pieces here see now, like now, it broke off apart this little piece here. I'm, of course, go going to fix this, but this little piece of metal is going to go and short circuit somewhere, right? I mean, most of the, the plug-in modules, they look like hand soldering without any cleaning. That is very weird. Let's take another one. Let's hand soldering and very, very bad soldering. I mean, I am far from impressed. This is not the kind of boiler care level I am used to see. So what happened here? So now I am about ready to reassemble my unit. I just wanted to show you how much electronic there is, really is in this thing. So that's just all the boards. Only one of the board of the boards is like really pro pro the classic boiler and care kind of quality level that I'm kind of used to. Maybe this is from an, a new version or something like that. Maybe the rest is something like an internal prototype that left the building. I got uh, another one of their prototypes uh, 
uh, a few days ago, so so I've seen a little bit from each ends of <laughs> the quality. <laughs> Definitely, uh, everything here is uh, very much like hand soldering, hand modifications. It's yeah, just all over the place. Yeah, yeah. Well, well. I got good news. I got tired of p poking around with the neon bulbs. So I just put in some high efficiency red LEDs and it wasn't that difficult. And of course they fit perfectly in here. And to get them uh, into shining light sideways, because this is kind of what I want, all I did is take some fine sandpaper as you can see here and just sand them a little bit like this and now they shine very very nice and bright out that side where i created this little sanding it was that easy maybe you want to have a little look and see how good it works I think this works perfectly fine. And this is 5 milliamps, by the way. <laughs> oh, I'm happy about this. This is a much better solution. Now I am in the process of reassembling this entire unit. And this is a little bit of documentation about what is what here. So this is the shielded cable that went through this hole in the bottom PCB and this coax cable actually goes to the lamps and it's not it's uh, yeah it's not sharing any wires with anything and that is because the lamps is connected via switches and via a special winding on the transformer and uh, that is because they are not lit when you are running in battery mode switch mode converter mode to uh, preserve power and I believe the red and the yellow, that will be my lamp power. Now I'm going to go and plug in the cables for the LEDs and then I'm going to see. I think this yellow wire here is probably my common. So that will would be my positive lamp supply, but I will have to put in a resistor here. And then I believe the red one is the ground for the lamps. And this is the special switch. All those, let me get some light here. All those many layers of switches and this and that. And then connect it in series with the other set of sets of switches down here. That makes, this, this the only thing they do is just handling those lamps. Fantastic construction. So let's do a little test of the LEDs. Yes, it was the red and the yellow. And I think this works really, really well. All the lamps works. And they're not as, as bright and as shiny as the radio represent this. They look like deep red, really, really nice. And I actually think on the video, it looks like you can see a little bit of light in the other twos. I don't really see that so much here in the in the real world. Ha! I am really, really happy about this. So now I can go and assemble. So that will be the last little clip from the bottom. I think those two capacitors, that will be the positive and the negative um, supply for all the logic stuff. It's supposed to be uh, plus minus 28 uh, according to the schematic, but I measure only 25. So that will be a good point for my resistor for my LED light. And that will be the original 350 volts. And that is the 220K 
series resistor for the original um, neon bulbs. It was sitting here, so I just lifted it like that. So it's easy to see what the modi modification was. And now I got a uh, 5 milliamp LED light running here. I also cleaned a little bit uh, around here with all the super nasty stuff. And as you can see, all the switches are nice and beautiful and all this has been cleaned up. I had to remove this capacitor during uh, the cleanup process so I could make it nice and shiny. I added some varnish around here and because here we didn't have a proper safe distance to chassis so I also varnished the tracks here and also the tracks here at the side. We need proper distance. And of course it's working, so now I'm going to test a little bit more and uh, I'll play a little bit more with this unit. I'm testing some of the filters. Of course this unit is super nice and stable and reliable. When I go in and out of all the buttons and dials here and it's just wonderful to work with now. I really like this unit and you can use it for a lot of cool experiments. Um, so this is the filter C and uh, my analyzer sweep here is set for about 0 to 60 kilohertz. So this is a filter C and you can't really see in this view any difference between B and C. But let's go to A and then you see a little bit of a difference. So filter D is looking a lot different in the low frequency range. Let's turn off those filters and then we'll get a flat curve. And uh, like I said, this is a 60 kilohertz sweep. And of course, if I push the 22 kilohertz uh, cut off, then it's going to look like this. And you see here, this is between 18 and 24. How about that? So of course the unit works and um, the reason why we couldn't see any difference between B and C, uh, let's look at the, the data sheet or the manual for the different uh, filters. That is because the difference is in the very low frequency uh, range. So now we'll of course try and take the analyzer and zoom into the low frequency area. So now I've set up the analyzer for 0 to 1 kilohertz. So now we can look at the very low frequency part of the filters. And of course we're going to try the low cutoff. Of course I also need to use a lot of average. Otherwise you're not going to get a nice and smooth curve. And this is of course the low cut. So that works as well. So that will be the D filter. And that is definitely a much wider base remove. Oh, A is even more. Look at that, it removes Oi, 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 that is effective. That removes everything below, what, 150 hertz or something like, like that. Very, very effective. And B. Oh, look at that. That's much more narrow band base cut. So this is very good for a rumble filtering. And then the C. It's not doing a lot, but just low cut as well. Let's try and remove the filters. So that was the flat cut and then the normal low cut is not going so super deep. But of course I don't have, in this kind of setup here, I don't have super high resolution in the low frequency. I could of course zoom in and get super high resolution and then take a lot of data in and then it's going to go super slow. That is how it is if you want high resolution and low frequency. Yes, it takes time. 
So yeah, there was actually a few more things I wanted to show and to talk about um, this really, really wonderful, versatile unit. See, I am in times one output attenuator. And this is the input attenuator. Uh, that is a three volt RMS. Let me take this away. So that is three millivolts, the most sensitive range. And now the input is of course open. But what happens if I crank this down here? Now you can see, so that will be a times 10. So that is 0.3 millivolts. Oy, 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 oy. So now we're all the way down and it is insanely sensitive. Of course, the input should be shorted for this. Otherwise, it's just going to crank up everything, right? So this is 10 microvolts full range, but it's just way too sensitive for this. And also, uh, the cabinet here is open, so it's going to pick up uh, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, you can even see that. So this is the background. See, if I just go... Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. Or maybe it's... Yeah, it's here. Ooh, yo, 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 yo. This is where we go. Yeah, this definitely need the case. <laughs> 